Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the SEC1 Satellite Symposium for the ESHG 2021. Today, we'll be talking about uh, performance of exome CNV analysis versus traditional methods in clinical environments. My name is Jean-Marc Holder. I'm a Chief Strategy Officer at SEC1, and together with Kelvin Yai, we'll be co-chairing this session. Our speakers today are going to be, uh, of course, ladies first, Laure Raymond, a biologist with Eurofins Beyond This, who will focus on the challenges involved in interpreting exome CNVs. Samantha Brunel, a PhD in molecular biology and SecOne's genomic product expert, who will discuss implementing these, uh, these sorts of CNV analysis in clinical routine using a commercial software package. Uh, and last but absolutely not least, Professor Laurent Ménard, uh, uh, PhD in, in physiopathology and a nephrologist working at the Sorbonne University and the Thénault Hospital, which is part of the Parisian network of hospitals, who will be talking about the clinical impact of exome CNVs and how it is really implemented in clinical routine. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over the microphone to Laurent, who will uh, engage the first session. And thank you very much for attending, all of you. OK, thank you, Jean-Marc, for this kind of introduction. I am uh, about to present uh, the clinical impact of uh, uh, CNV analysis um, uh, in adult uh, nephrology. I am the professor Laurent Mena from Sorbonne University. Uh, I do not have um, any conflict of interest in this presentation. So as you might know, chronic kidney disease uh, is uh, uh, do lead to roughly 80,000 patients to uh, end-stage renal disease. And so far, uh, 3 million patients have been infected in France from uh, uh, chronic kidney disease with or without uh, renal insufficiency. And uh, among this part, half of them are on dialysis and half of them are on kidney, uh, uh, do receive a kidney graft. A fraction have been affected by no nephropathies. And so I will show that in this part of and no nephropathies, especially, uh, you you might find 30% um, with uh, a Mendelian-related uh, disease uh, explaining the, the renal disease. And the question is, when we can start, when we have to start a genomic test from 3 million patients to 80,000 patients, uh, given that 30% are uh, from unknown nephropathies, and among them, 30% are affected by uh, a Mendelian disease, as I will show you. So, kidney disease uh, have, uh, have a high cost of care, lead to a high cost of in, in health care in France, especially, and other uh, um, uh, European development country. And as sub, um, uh, this, this tiny part of 80,000 people cost a lot, a lot for the healthcare system compared to uh, uh, here, uh, cardiac disease, uh, diabetes. Uh, the larger the cycle, the larger the, the number of people associated with the, the disease, and uh, the cost is here. So, given this, 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 this in mind, an error diagnosis might delay a kidney failure by prevention measure, therapeutic uh, uh, provided early on. And so when we, you, you reach end stage renal disease in years here, and you have uh, any strategy, prevention strategy, therapeutic strategy you can start before, you can delay the enter of in dialysis, and you can uh, provide to the patient better quality of light for many years before it can reach end stage renal disease without the prevention measure or a therapeutic. So even though the patient reach end stage renal disease here, if you can detect and prevent uh, and treat earlier, um, 
some some patient uh, in the family you, by screening and providing screening because you reach a better diagnosis, you can uh, limit the cost for the society, improve the quality of life for the entire family, uh, uh, especially. So to sum up, the diagnosis code for kidney, uh, for kidney uh, disease is quite large for a, a small number of patients. And the cost of a, a large screening is especially to, to screen for a, a genetic disease is uh, quite low compared to their uh, total cost. And uh, the prevention measure, uh, especially in the, in the family, could lead to uh, delaying the diuresis and uh, limiting the, could limit the cost of our uh, treatment. So as you might know, diagnostic um, kidney disease is complicated because many diseases are lead to end stage renal disease. Here, there are listed more than 278 genetic disease. You need a, a, a specialist trained in, uh, in the diagnosis for, uh, of renal disease. It's time consuming, very expensive. So in, even though you, you, you try to do your best, at the end, 30% of patients today remain in dinos uh, when they receive a, their first renal transplant. In 2008, a milestone study, a foreign study, uh, has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine by the Garavi Group from Columbia University, studying more than 4,000 people uh, with end stage renal disease with uh, exome sequencing. People uh, age re range from 80s to 90s year old. And in this unselected population, uh, Garavi group reached uh, more than 10% diagnostic yield. So at the same time in France, we, we managed to do a pilot study uh, that we published um, in a letter in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, showing that uh, we can reach a, a much higher diagnostic yield uh, but we do select younger patients with a family history of kidney disease and especially uh, affected by uh, undetermined uh, nephropathies. So after this pilot study, we, we decided at the Tottenham Hospital Sorbonne University to, to provide to any patient uh, exome sequencing as a clinical diagnostic test in first intention. And uh, we decide to provi provide a clinical standard of care uh, exome sequencing in our university based on NCMG classification and uh, a clinical uh, uh, part of the health care. And we, we, we discuss more complex cases in uh, multidisciplinary uh, uh, teams to decide the indication of uh, the the exome test. And this project has been uh, in collaboration with the uh, Tenon Hospital Super University and Eurofin Biomnis and Sequon platform, uh, as we discussed later. So the end, at the end stage, uh, renal uh, stage, the inclusion criteria was uh, the suspicion of a genetic factor in the illness of the patient, the disease, renal disease. Young age, severity of the of the disease, and um, a positive family history, especially, but this was not mandatory. And even though at the end, the absence of clear diagnosis uh, suspected by the clinical team, the exclusion criteria was uh, evident uh, autosomic dominant polycystic kidney disease. Uh, when we reach obviously a diagnosis with uh, past uh, molecular analysis with NGS or not. And uh, we do not uh, um, uh, enroll a patient suffering from uh, acquired renal disease such as diabetes, immune related nephropathies, as opposed to the Garavi group uh, initially. So the results so far, we are roughly at 600 patients uh, is 27 uh, diagnostic yield. And uh, this diagnostic yield was um, uh, in patients of uh, 30, 41 years old in average, 
60% had a family history of renal failure. Nine out of 10 have been tested with an exome solo, not a trio. Uh, and we succeed in making the diagnosis in most of the most cases. And we provide a clinical uh, conclusion um, using exome solo and uh, ranking, we rank our variant according uh, ACMG classification, uh, listing class, class four and five uh, ACMG variant. So just a, a slide uh, on SNVs compared to CNVs, I will talk uh, more in detail. And we reach a 27 diagnostic field with SNVs. And among these SNVs, we can uh, now uh, uh, confirm uh, other uh, studies in the literature. 30% uh, of patients will be affected by Alport syndrome, uh, uh, autosomic uh, recessive polykinesis disease, nephronoptesis, uh, and other. And we'll focus especially on the CNVs uh, and the denucic yield. Um, uh, associated with uh, CNVs, and we reach uh, uh, an additional 1% of diagnosis. Uh, the list of genes uh, that have been found are listed on, on the right here. NPHP1, including 16, call, call uh, 4A3, on call 4A4, PAX2. So overall, the, the diagnostic yield was 28%. So if we focus on the CNVs and uh, renal disease in adults, very few studies have been done so far. Uh, they have not been done uh, with the same exome assay, uh, analyzing uh, SNVs and CNVs. And we demonstrate with the SEQUEN platform uh, and with uh, the, the feasibility uh, of that. And we were able especially to, to find a canonical deletion the homozygous, uh, homozygous deletion of NPHP1, which brings similar incidence of, uh, of its deletion, homozygous deletion in all population, like the um, SNRC uh, paper published uh, in 2008. Most of the time, the, the diagnosis was unsuspected. And for these few patients, still, we, these diagnoses have a clinical and uh, relevant impact. A few examples. Uh, this um, ladies of um, 50 year olds with proteinuria, hematuria, and focal segmental glomerulosclerosis leading to chronic renal failure uh, has been affected by an heterozygous deletion with uh, discordant rich pairs that have been confirmed by the Sanger sequencing uh, later on. And uh, uh, this variant has been classified as lactic pathogenic associated with the, the phenotypic description uh, here. Another example is uh, this man of uh, 52 year olds that reached NSTAR general disease at 25 and has been transplanted later on. Uh, the, the, the phenotypic overall description was a tubular interstitial disease with a nephrocalcinosis. And uh, we reached the, the diagnosis of uh, an homozygous deletion of codeine 16. Uh, as you can see, this exon is completely absent in the, the IGV screenshot here. And the deletion uh, has been confirmed by nanopore sequencing later on. So in conclusion, uh, overall, we reach a, a diagnostic yield of uh, 28%. Uh, among the basically uh, mainly undetermined nephropathies using uh, the same pipeline for exome diagnosis, uh, looking at SNVs and CNVs. CNVs account for a small fraction, roughly 1%, but there's a, most of the time with a clinical relevant diagnosis. And uh, I think uh, the exome analysis will uh, uh, is already a standard of care uh, to an hospital summer university as in other or larger center. We will move on, uh, I think, uh, on all genome uh, sequencing as a next step uh, and providing a unique test 
uh, is, I think, better for the patient. And a diagnosis with this diagnosis could lead to screening of patient, and at the end, uh, limiting the cost uh, to the healthcare system and improving the quality of life of the patient. We expect a more uh, more diagnosis, uh, especially on CNVs with uh, all uh, genome sequencing, at least a similar rate of diagnosis with uh, all genome sequencing compared to all exome sequencing during the given method with uh, targeted capture. Thank you for your attention. So, hi everyone, and thanks for attending this meeting. Working in a diagnostic laboratory, Eurofence Biomnis in Lyon, France. And um, we, um, we've seen just before with Laurent that the detection of copy number variation is clinically relevant for the prescribing clinician. But before, as a lab, giving this kind of result, we have to be sure of the sensitivity and specificity. So what I will show you now is um, the, the way we validated this technique. You all know that there are traditionally different techniques to find copy number variation. The karyotype is um, the, the most well-known one. Um, the resolution is around 10 megabases. Then you have microarray, which is a, a bit more resolutive. And then you have MLPA, which is much more resolutive, but it's a panel-based approach. You cannot see all the genome in only one uh, technique. If we could um, use copy number variation detection based on exam sequencing data, we um, could perform all this kind of analysis in only one step. For example, when we see a child with intellectual disability, the classic clinic path consists in performing microarray analysis. In 10% of the cases, you will get a diagnosis. But in 90% of the cases, there will be no diagnosis. So you will need to go through panel analysis or directly through exome sequencing. This kind of uh, um, approach made by different techniques is um, costly, is uh, time consuming because you will need several medical consultations and several techniques. On the other side, if you directly perform exome sequencing and copy number variant detection based on exome sequencing data, you will have a, a one-step diagnosis in only three to six weeks. And the diagnostic yield will be the, the one of exome sequencing, which is estimated around 30 to 40 percent. The diagnosis of microarray, around 10 percent, and the diagnostic of small copy number variation with which is not yet really well quantified. So choosing the right technique will impact the turn turnaround time and the diagnostic yield. Before detecting CNV based on exome sequencing data, they are mandatory prerequisites. Um, we needed to have a good bioinformatic pipeline, which is well implemented with a, a model based on an homogeneous cohort of patients. So we, we had to overcome this challenge. And we had, we had then to validate the analytical performance, so the equivalence to microarray, MLPA, and karyotype. So the first step was, of course, to, to, bind, to build this uh, bioinformatic tool, then to use a, a cohort of controls to determine sensitivity and accuracy, and then we performed a prospective study. For the wet lab, we use an um, exam of twist bioscience with the spike. We perform the sequencing on Nexec um, 5500, sorry, on Illumina and uh, Nexec 2000. And we generated in um, two fold uh, 75 base pairs with uh, 50 million pairs of reads on the one and uh, 35 million pairs of reads on twofold um, 150 base pairs on the other sequencer. For the dry lab, we used the GATK4 pipeline, the RefSec target, and we processed around 3,000 samples. The first thing we wanted to evaluate was the model precision. We wanted to know when we 
see all the copy number variant we detect if we have a high false positive rate or a low one. And for this uh, purpose, we counted the number of CNV patients we could detect after having excluded the copy number variants that are present in more than 5% of the cohorts. And we, we, what we can see is that we have less than 10 copy number variants of small size that contain an homimorbid gene, and uh, 0 to 1 to 2, depending on the patient, copy number variant with um, a large size, so above uh, 50 KB. So for each patient, you only have to manually inspect 4 to 6 copy number variant, which is feasible. But when we decided to exclude the variants that are present in more than 5% of the patient, what did we really exclude? We made a comparison with um, DGV, and what we can see is that here in black, almost all the copy number variants we excluded are polymorphisms that are known in DGV. And a small, small part of them are not present in DGV, so it may be artifacts or it may be polymorphisms that are not known in GGV because they are maybe too small. So we cannot conclude and we should consider it as a blind region for copy number variant detection. But finally, it represented only half percent of the capture and uh, contained only seven homimorbidges that were only partially affected. So it it does allow us to make a good interpretation based on this data. The second step was to evaluate the sensitivity of the technique. So we did comparison with gold standard techniques, karyotype, microarray, and MLPA or NGS panel. First, against karyotype, we had 10 controls with various abnormalities um, from deletion, duplication, triplications. For example, the diagnostic correlation was 100%, so it was a very, very good correlation. This is an example of one of our controls. You, we, we had on a karyotype two chromosomics and a deletion of um, and a, a, a small part of Y chromosome that is on the X chromosome. You can see here with the fish and the karyotype, and here is the formula. So we had a, a more precise um, view of the Y chromosome. So you can see here we've performed microarray on this patient. Here you're concerned on the Y chromosome that only this part and this part of the chromosome Y are present. And this region here is deleted and deleted. And what we could see on the copy number variant uh, on exome CNV sequencing data, on exome sequencing data, is that you effectively have the two copies of X chromosome, and for the Y chromosome, you have exactly the same profile, a perfectly overlapping profile between here and here. The second step was to make comparison with microarray. We had 22 controls, and the diagnostic correlation was again 100%. We had, uh, in this case as well, deletion, duplication, triplication. Here is an example of the triplication. So we had here the triplication of this region, which is a Katai syndrome. And what you can see here is that the, exactly the same region is triplicated. So you can see here you have four copies here and two copies for the rest of the chromosome. So the same on exome sequencing data has the same sensitivity compared to microarray, except for intronic region that are missed because you don't have exons, so you don't capture these regions. But we can ask ourselves if this is medically relevant to, to detect this variant. It could be, but not that often. You have here an other example of Angelman syndrome. So here we have a, we have a deletion of um, chromosome 15. And the profile and the copy number variation detection on um, exome sequencing data. So it's perfectly overlapping again. The last step was to compare against MLPA or um, copy number variant detection NGS panel. We had five controls with hemizygous, homozygous deletion, 
with uh, heterozygous deletion, with duplication, and with triplication. And we were able to detect all these variations that did encompass only one or a few exons. So here you have an example of the, a patient, a boy with an hemozygous deletion of uh, one exon of DMD. You can see here the exon, and here's the deletion. You can see that there is zero copy of this exon. So the big advantage compared to MLPR or copy number variant on panel is that with CNV on exome, you've got a comprehensive approach that is completely agnostic, and there is no limitation. After this first step of um, retrospective validation, we performed a prospective study on our around 3,000 patients to see what we can detect. So this child, for example, has uh, intrauterine growth retardation, conalatresia, diaphragmatic hernia, and uh, respiratory distress. And you can see all the patients in the run. You can see uh, this patient is completely in blue on the chromosome 18. So blue is for duplication, and you can see here as well the duplication. So this patient has a trisomy 18, and he, he, he has exome first. He did not have karyotyping before, he did not have microarray before. He had this technique first, and uh, we can detect this trisomy 18 without any, any problem. And we could confirm it on um, uh, microarray analysis. Here you can see a child with epilepsy and hypotonia, and what we could detect on copy number variant based on exome sequencing data is a deletion of one part of the chromosome one. So here you have only one copy, an heterozygous deletion, and it was a 1p46 deletion. And we could confirm it with microarray, so you can see exactly the same profile between CNV based on exome sequencing data and microarray. Then we had a child with intellectual disability, in which we detected a deletion of exons 11 to 75 of USP7 that explains his phenotype and which was confirmed by QPCR. So on the cohort, our preliminary results on exam and copy number variation detection on exam um, sequencing data showed that we had around a person diagnostic yield, but which may be higher because we did not consider uh, CN SNV in trends of uh, the copy number variation. So um, there may be um, compound heterozygous patients. We have in our court a mix of patients who had exam first approach and a mix of patients who had first microarray, which was, which was negative. So it um, underestimate the, the real diagnostic rate. And we, are, we had a mix of pathologies, mixing intellectual disability and malformation syndromes and renal disease. So the diagnostic yield is not expected to be the same between such condition and this other one. As a conclusion, what we could say is that for us, a detection of, an, uh, of copy number variation based on exome sequencing data is a new standard of care. We have a clear result with a good sensitivity and a high precision. In only one technique, we can detect SNV indels and exonic CNVs of all size based to only one exon to the whole chromosome. And we can do interpretation in only one step. So that means that we can uh, make the addition between the standard diagnostic of exome sequencing of 30 to 40 percent, the 10 percent diagnostic yield of microarray, and the 2 percent of above or above diagnostic yield of um, small copy number variants. So this performance is really improved compared to the previous technique because we are completely agnostic, but precise, and for, for, for sure it is less expensive and uh, for the patient more comfortable because, and for the prescribing clinician as well, because you can see the patient only once and have a complete uh, result in one time. So the next need we have now is to have a CADVD and user-friendly uh, platform for performing the analysis as a routine. Thank you for your attention.
Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Samantha Bruno. I'm a product expert at Sec1 Genomics. And I'll continue on the topic of exome CNVs and show you how we can tackle CNV detection in exomes using a genomic analysis platform. Uh, a few words about who we are first. Uh, Sec1 is a French startup based in Montpellier in the south of France that was founded in 2017. And what we do is that we develop state-of-the-art genomic analysis tools readily available on the platform for clinical applications in the field of cancer and rare diseases. And in only a few years, the platform has been adopted in a wide range of healthcare establishments, including university hospitals, but also private sector testing labs. And with a focus on bioinformatics and AI, we are also really active in R&D. Uh, the second platform itself is a cloud-based end-to-end solution for genomic analysis. Here you can see the complete workflow, starting from the sequencing files. Uh, we then proceed with the bioinformatic analysis and also quality controls for many different applications. Um, and then you have access to an easy-to-use interpretation interface with access to uh, many annotation databases and finally a reporting tool. Uh, now we strongly believe in the power of R&D, as I said before, and uh, invest a lot of resources in building bioinformatic tools that provide more medically relevant information. So to achieve this, we are not only focusing on the detection of frequently occurring variants like SNVs or indels that you see in gray on the chart, but we also continuously implement new tools to detect less common variants, but that are yet impactful for the patient. And in today's demonstration in particular, I will walk you through the workflow of CNV analysis on exomes with sec one So here we are on the sec one platform doing the interpretation of our exome. And what you see here on the screen is the interpretation interface for small variants in sec one where you have listed here all the mutations detected in our patients and different annotations from various databases. So what we can see straight away here is that we have an interesting variant uh, at the top of this list. It was ranked first by our AI-driven ranking tool. It is also classified as pathogenic based on the ACMG criteria that you can see here. And if we have a look here uh, at the end of the table, we can see that it's a homozygous variant. So it's an interesting one. It could be the end of the story here. But let's have a look at the CNV results as well. First, let me introduce um, the CNV interpretation interface on sec one. As you can see, you have different sections on this page. I'm going to walk you through each of them. Let's start on the left. Here you have the actual list of variants that were identified for your sample with their genomic coordinates, their size, their frequency within your patient cohort the type of CNV and also how many ORMI morbid genes are encompassed within the CNV. You can apply some filters to this. You can filter based on the size, for example, of the CNV, but also uh, based on the frequency of the CNV within your patient cohort. Let's select the first one here, 800 base pairs um, deletion in chromosome 1. And moving to the right, you have different sections as well with elements of annotation on your the CNV that you've just selected. So let's select the first one here, 800 base pairs deletion on chromosome 1. Here on the right you have different sections with different elements and annotation. We can see for example from here that it is actually found within the H2A gene, which is the same gene as we've seen before, and it's actually only affecting a single exon. And if I go here down below, I can see that actually it overlaps with the variant that I've seen before, which is right here. So now by looking at the joint results of small variants and CNVs, we have a more accurate and complete picture of what's actually going on with this patient that has on the one hand a deletion and on the other hand a variant that faces this deletion, hence the homozygous genotype. It also shows that CNVs applied to exomes is able to actually detect events at the scale of a single exon. Now let's try and challenge our tool with bigger events. And for this I will show you a second example. So different patients, same view. In that case I'm selecting the first CNV listed here, which is 2 megabases long, yet another deletion on chromosome 1. 
To the right, I can see that this CNV partially overlaps with known clinical regions from Clingen and OMIM. And here you have the complete lists of all the OMIM morbid genes that are within the boundaries of this CNV and how, mu how much they overlap. You also have information regarding associated phenotypes and transmission modes. Another interesting database to, um, to query is DGV. In that case, you can see whether your CNV overlaps with CNVs from the DGV database and if you're watching. And that tells you whether what you're looking at is a clinically relevant CNV or if it's just polymorphism. Now let me reveal another element from this view, which is the visualization tool. So this view might be familiar to you. It was really inspired from cytogenetic tools. And here you have the visualization of the number of copies uh, for your sample across the different genes here, which are down below. So what we can see from the color code here is that the deletion is quite clear cut here uh, to the left. And then the signal, the normal signal around zero copies is quite consistent for the remainder of the chromosome. So CNV exome can not only detect events within a single gene, but also aggregates the information across um, neighboring genes in one single big interval, as it's the case here. Now, uh, let me show you yet how big those intervals can be. Uh, let me show you yet another example to illustrate that. So in that case, we have on chromosome 18 a gain of copy that is 77 megabases long. And actually, when you have a look at the information here to the right, you can see that it's quite clearly a case of uh, a duplication of the whole chromosome. And to really appreciate that, let's go to the visualization here again. And you can see from this karyotype view up here that in the window that we're looking at currently, the whole chromosome 18 is actually selected. And here you have the signal across the whole chromosome, which is completely consistent and really showing that the whole chromosome is duplicated. So with these three examples, we've seen that CNV exomes can work from small intervals uh, at the scale of one single exon, but also uh, detect events that are um, stretching across whole chromosomes. Um, so now that you got a glimpse of Sequon, I just wanted to summarize a few key points to describe a platform. Uh, first, it is an end-to-end -end solution, and it manages all the steps required to produce a clinical-grade genomic report, starting from the sequencing files. We can work with most major wet lab providers. We also help you with uh, regulatory compliance, with the validation of changes in your laboratory processes, etc. And, of course, once you're up and running, our support staff also assist your team in their day-to-day -day activity. Now, how do we implement CNV exome for our users? Um, there are a few requirements. Exome CNV detections relies on a statistical model that has to be created from a reference cohort. For an acceptable sensitivity, in our experience, this cohort must be uh, at least composed of 80 samples that were obtained from similar wet lab and sequencing procedures. Now, of course, more samples can be added to this model along the way in order to improve the performances. It is especially important for the specificity. If you already have a model available, we can implement it directly. Otherwise, we will provide help at every stage of the process. So first, we help you choosing the right exome cohort. Uh, we help you with the number of samples, with the choice of controls. Uh, as I said before, we can work with any wet lab provider, so long as the samples are processed in a reproducible way. Once the model is generated, we also ensure that it meets your quality requirements. Uh, we check the controls, we check the levels of artifacts, etc. And once the model is satisfactory, we deliver it to you and also organize a training session for you. So you can start. To conclude this session, Laurent Menard emphasized how systematic MGS analysis can improve diagnostic outcomes and patient lifespan in adult nephrology, while also lowering the costs. Um, then Laurent Raymond demonstrated how exome CNV should be the new standard of care Indeed, as a single test, it allows one to identify the full range of variants, thus improving diagnostic yield while also reducing turnaround times. 
And I hope with this short presentation that I also convinced you of how powerful the CNV Exxon pipeline integrated in an easy to use genomic platform such as Sequon can be. I thank you very much for your attention. Great. Uh, well, uh, thanks a lot, everybody, to be here in, the, in this session. And thanks for the people who, who asked some questions, and we'll be happy to answer it. So I wanted first to thank Laurent for his talk on uh, clinical um, necessity of uh, exome and CNV calling um, in a renal disease. Laurent, for this beautiful talk and how to uh, use exome as a one and unique technique um, and Samantha for this clear talk and on how we can make it with that one. So um, let's start for the question. And the first question were, was from Cheryl. Uh, I think, Laura, you, you kind of answered the question and maybe uh, it, it can be helpful to, uh, to go uh, on it again because, of course, um, did you uh, get any discordant cases so uh, cases found on classic methods for CNV calling, but not found on exome sequencing. Does it happen? And uh, did you have a minimum size that you could detect? So probably you said that it was single exome, uh, but maybe you can uh, mm -hmm. confirm. Laura? So yeah, thank, well, thank, thank you for the question. And Laura, I think we'll emphasize that. We, we do not so far have a, uh, discordant, but the number of patients is not that high. So far, so far in, in a nephrology setting, it's 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 difficult to answer to that question specifically. And I will let you lower on, lower on discuss more on that maybe on on in Samantha on the technical and uh, lab aspect more on the clinical expert. And so far, we are able to, to find a small deletion of one or two exons, in, in, for example, in the BBS4 genes. And uh, it was homozygous uh, deletion, so it's quite easy to find. And um, we have not uh, extensively uh, looked at specific deletion in the, the field of nephrology so far uh, in the adult uh, uh, nephrology uh, group. So yes, I will confirm we, we did not miss any event uh, and we had um, division at heterozygous state, at homozygous state, hemizygous as well. We had duplication, triplication from one exon size to the whole chromosome. So we did not miss anything, but it is not possible to affirm that we will never miss anything. What I can say more is that when we detect something now with um, exome sequencing uh, CNV analysis, uh, is that we always confirm the variation and we didn't have any discordance. Okay, uh, thanks for the, both, thank you both for this uh, uh, complimentary answer. Uh, so uh, uh, now we, we can move on on, on the next question. Uh, the next question was uh, um, uh, more about uh, a technical aspect, must say, uh, in the in the second platform. Uh, so maybe I can ask Samantha to answer this question. Um, so. Uh, how reliable we can detect single exon deletion of duplication on autosome, and what kind of um, methods do we use for CNV calling in sequence platform? Okay, yeah, okay, I can take that. So I think the answer to the first question was already given. We are able to detect events at the scale of an exon and up to the scale of the whole chromosome. Now, when it comes to the, the technical aspects, the tool that we, we use is GATK. Uh, so this is a gold standard. We benchmark different tools, and then we, we selected this one. Um, and I think because uh, it is it it, it it needs relies on a hidden market model, like you said, for CMB detection. And it's uh, it's one of the most performing tools that there is out there for this type of application. Yeah, if I can add just because I think that Thierry has uh, asked an uh, additional uh, uh, question about it. Uh, I think uh, one of the main uh, things was uh, to succeed in creation of the model, and maybe it's the, the, the most hardest task to have, but uh, when you succeed to create it, then you get performances really well, and, and as uh, Samantha said, we use a uh, JTK4. Um, th thanks for... for 
thanks Amanda for the answer, sorry. Um, if we move on to the next question, uh, Cheryl asks if um, uh, we have different uh, confidence intervals for large CNV coin or small, uh, large copy number variants or small copy number variants. Uh, so I presume that uh, do we uh, uh, are more um, uh, reliable on large uh, copy number variants or small copy number variants. I don't know if um, uh, maybe Laura can say something about it. Do, do you, did you see something different? Yes. So uh, at the beginning, we thought that um, it would be more easy to detect large deletions, for example. But finally, the, the more we, we um, gather sample and the more we, we have um, knowledge on the CNV, um, we noticed that it was really um, the detection of, of small events um, to one example, for example, was really reliable as well. So we had uh, high confidence on small events as well, and very, um, not, it was not noisy at all. Very nice. Th thanks for this uh, answer. So it seems really reliable, and it's uh, the good thing to if you want to use it in the in the clinical routine. So uh, I, I just uh, ask for for the audience if if you want to say uh, in a Q and A if you already use CNV detection in exon sequencing, maybe you can like uh, provide your feedback, and um, and especially if you use it on the renal disorder, you can maybe then you can share. Uh, your your experience uh, experiment experience sorry um, so feel free to use the Q and A for that uh, so uh, the next question is probably for Samantha uh, so do we in Sequan work with panels or only with exons uh, so we can work with both uh, we can handle panels and exons and we can work with any wet lab providers. And for applications in the range of rare disease, constitutional disease, somatic analysis, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think the question is, the, red, the answer is pretty clear. <laughs> and yeah, we, I think we can uh, like uh, uh, find a, a pipeline for every uh, kind of uh, analysis. So feel free to, uh, to, to come by and uh, we're happy to answer uh, your question if you have more about how you can do second for for your lab. Um, uh, to like to ask uh, a more um, a question for a clinician, I would say Laurent. Um, so with all these different talks, uh, I think now it's quite difficult to, to think that we should not uh, detect CNV with exome. So do you think Today, you can prescribe a genetic test without getting CNV calling detection. Yeah, thank you for the question. And I, I, I wish to, uh, I, we have to, to do that, I think. But now, uh, I think it's not in the, in, in the nephrological uh, adult part uh, of the genetic world. It's not done uh, every day. And we're just looking, just looking more for HPHP1, homozygous deletion, that you're the, the most uh, uh, well-known uh, cause of uh, renal disease in adults. Um, so I wish we, we can have that uh, on the top in any SNV analysis, I think it's very important for the patient, even though so far the uh, the level of 1% is quite low for some people, but I think for the, for the patient it's very high and relevant. So a pledge for. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for this answer, Laurent, for sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we need it. I think like, uh, yeah, for sure patients are, are, are there. And uh, answer of the most, especially with the same essay. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. And and to to follow this question, maybe it's for Laurent Laurent. Uh, so, uh, how is it easy to uh, interpret SNVs and CNVs uh, in your routine with sequence? Is it is it uh, like uh, difficult, or you feel that you can interpret SNVs and CNVs easily? Ladies first. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, it, it's much more easy with Sequan because as, as Samantha showed, maybe we have um, the CNV on one part of the screen and just below the SNV. So it's really easy to, to make the diagnostic by this way because just before we were using Excel files on one side and then copying the genes on Sequan on the other side, so it was not uh, user-friendly. <laughs> And I will, I will say, even though for a clinician like me, which is very fun to help the analysis with the, the second platform, it's quite easy. So I think, uh, yeah, it's very, it's it's quite to notice that this platform allow to people like me, clinician, that was not uh, especially uh, uh, rad labs to. To find some, to, to find out that might be a diagnosis that would be validated by the biologist at the end. Thanks for, for this uh, answer. I'm happy to, to know that is a kind of uh, uh, easy to use and and uh, yeah, you, you you two are kind of um, uh, interpreting some sometimes the the, the exams together. So. Uh, it's maybe also something that the uh, sequence provide only, and it's kind of. I think it's a, uh, it's uh, it's really maybe helpful to to have uh, uh, this team of clinical biologists uh, interpreting the exams. So that, that's uh, maybe something uh, that uh, I, I will ask your experience after that and how you you interpret together sometimes uh, uh, analysis. Uh, but before uh, we have a, a question from. Uh, I'm sorry if I, I, I pronounce and not good your, your, your name. Uh, and probably it's for Samantha. Uh, so uh, do we have a, 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 a cloud-only based solution or do we have an on-premise solution? That's a very good question. So the solution is mostly used, uh, is cloud-based. Um, so at the moment there is no on-premise solution for second. But uh, we are open to collaboration, so if that's one of your needs, do not hesitate to come and talk with us. Great. So may maybe, Laurent and Laurent, you, can, can you tell us how you work together and how uh, you interpret uh, somehow, sometimes together? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we, we managed to use the Sequel platform together uh, from uh, town to town, from Paris to, to Lyon, for example, and to discuss patient we, we, uh, we, we collect in, uh, in, in Paris. And uh, the real value of the platform beyond uh, the CNV and SNV analysis is to provide a real, real interface that could suit the clinician, and I think so the, the biologist as well, and to integrate both knowledge uh, and especially in the nephrology field, as of the field I know. And so we can provide the clinical part and uh, the biological part at the same time, discussing in, on the, the same language using the, the platform. So it's think, and we do uh, separate analysis and combine. And so it's, uh, uh, I think, a real value for the patient. It's a tool analyzed from different point of view that have been compared, uh, and I think it. I think at the end, it's the, it's the good process. But uh, we'll see if uh, the times will tell. Uh, that's the good the good way to go, to do. Maybe law you can from the, from your side. I will say. <laughs> So for the side of the biologist, I think it's really interesting to have the um, uh, clinician point of view on the data, directly on the data, and not um, only the, the results I will deliver. Um, and the, the, um, the fact that we do the, the two reading of the data is, um, I think, will improve the um, diagnostic uh, rate. Oh, sometimes I find something that it might not be found fine by the by by law and vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to know that team play is better than a uh, yeah uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know. It's good to know that uh, you enjoy the work together and and for for the patient it's of course better. Uh, nice. So now uh, we still have five minutes. So uh, I will uh, ask probably Sam 
Samantha, uh, uh, one of the questions we have uh, often is, uh, uh, so how many patients do I need to have CNG coding in Sequin and how can I get it in, uh, in, in my lab? So getting it in your lab is pretty much as easy as getting Sequin in the lab. So I will start with that. So if you were to get started with Sequin, the first step would be uh, to meet with us so we can understand your needs. Then you, we would set up uh, your private working space, which is completely encrypted so that only you and your colleagues can have access to it. So we set up a dashboard with you and uh, we transfer, help you transfer your first data. Then you receive a training to all the tools that you need. And then before you get started with routine analysis, we can also help you with um, your accreditations and method validations as well. Now, the only specifics for the, uh, the CNV XO as compared to the other pipelines that are available is that there is a need for a model that we build for you. Uh, and this requires a minimal amount of samples. So we found that the minimal would be around 80 samples to provide good sensitivity and also good specificity. Of course, the more the better. And it's really important that these exomes are uh, from your labs and because they need to be specific to your methodology and your techniques. Uh, so the model is um, more efficient and, and robust. So if you don't have all the exomes available at first, it's really not a problem. You can get started and once you're ready and you reach a sufficient cohort, then we get in touch and we can help you get you started with the CNV exome. Knowing that uh, when it comes to building this model, uh, this is not a black box either. Uh, that's not the case for any of our pipelines, by the way, but we really help you select the samples that you need you get some feedback, feedback on the quality of your model as well, so you know some uh, basic metrics about its sensitivity, its specificity, uh, the amount of artifacts that you expect. Because in this model, this model is your real, real, real life patient cohorts with some positive control in there, some negative control in there. So we, first of all, we test the quality of your model and you have feedback on that, so that you know whether you can start confidently uh, analyzing your CMVs in second. Thanks, Samantha, for all this uh, key information. So we are like three minutes from from, from the the end of this uh, of this uh, session. Uh, I wanted to give uh, uh, to, to to provide the floor to Laurent, Laurent, and Samantha for maybe uh, one last word before we we need to to leave. So maybe Laurent. Okay, uh, long one last word. So I think uh, basically uh, the collaboration we, we, we have with, with Law and Sequan uh, provide for the nephrological community in France uh, the possibility to reach uh, many unsuspect diagnoses in, in, in adults, uh, especially in, the, in adults suffering from uh, undetermined nephropathy. And so I think it's uh, open a new avenue on, on the utility of uh, all exome. A, I wish we move to all genome sequencing uh, in, in the forthcoming uh, years uh, for the patient. Uh, I think it's a part of the national plan of sequencing in France. And uh, I think the overall, the, this will move uh, the national plan as well, uh, uh, move forward. That's, uh, so thanks for Sequon, thanks for my colleague Law in this process, uh, and by Miss Orofa uh, uh, as well. Uh, and uh, yes, thanks for the patience. Thanks, Laurent. Uh, yes, um, I think that now we've seen that uh, CNV detection is possible on exome sequencing data. It would be offered each time it's um, in each time a prescribing clinician asks for an exome. So we should always have CNV included. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, just to, to mention that C C copy number variation detection uh, uh, is. I think it's the first study, uh, to my knowledge, uh, in undetermined nephropathies and, and the, the yield we can reach uh, in this specific population uh, is still not published. We will publish soon with those results. And uh, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Yeah, we are thrilled to, to see the publication then. We're waiting for it. Okay. Uh, um, so it's almost the end. Uh, for, for me, I, I wanted to, to thank everybody to, to attend the session and for the question. I will let the last word for Samantha to end, end uh, this, this second session. Oh, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. So, yeah, I think what this talk illustrates is uh, the importance to really uh, design essays and analysis that really are comprehensive in the number of variations that they can tackle so that you reduce the number of tests that you need to do and everybody saves some time, saves some money as well, and the patient gets an answer uh, as quickly as possible. So, yeah, CNG exam was a, a big step for us and it was really due to a very tight collaboration uh, with the people who are present here. Uh, so, yeah, I hope we continue uh, um, tackling those challenges and, and uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything. And thank you, everyone, for your attention today. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Samantha. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Lauren. We'll be, we'll be I, I, I appreciate our, our moment together. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.